Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia. Welcome back to part 13 of our tutorial series on Total War Three Kingdoms featuring Cao Cao. And in this part, we're going to talk about making plans. So it's a very generalized concept because we're at a point where things are not so much in our control because I plan on holding Peng Cheng as a defensive uh, location to anticipate attack by Tao Tian, but I can't control when he will attack me. So in that aspect, we have to make plans elsewhere. And we are at the start of turn, so a good place to start is your notification. Some of these are events. We got a new character in Dian Wei through an event. We should go check him out. We also have some character development. As you can see, that Xiao Houyuan has been recalled. And we're going to use him for assignment because we did have an extra assignment slot, but we didn't have any characters available. And now that he's been summoned back to court, we can give him something to do. Aside from him, we see that we picked up a random Anzuri item. There's always a chance to spawn Anzuri items every turn. And in this case, we got pretty lucky in that we picked up a silver tier item called the Flying Daggers. It gives your character 10 points of instinct and 10% extra melee damage. So this will definitely go on one of our more offensive generals who can utilize this to increase their power in battle. So taking a look at our army, we can look at Xiao Houdun, and he would be the perfect character for this. He has a pretty balanced melee base damage, 850, so that would help. Now, of course, Cao Cao can also utilize this with 1k base damage, and probably can utilize it a bit more, because the instinct will increase the base damage, and then 10% on top, and he currently doesn't have any items here. But for long-term reasons if we ever get a good item for faction wide bonus where it requires a leader heir or a prime minister those items would go on Cao Cao first so in this case Xia Houdun being just a general it would be better to just give it to him and plus champions as a class are designed to be good duelists and in that case giving him extra instinct would just simply help him um, magnify his role as a duelist in our army. Okay, we're gonna equip this on him and then lastly we have a notification on all the buildings we have finished building and the demolitions of buildings so we have slots and this is the last turn of our economy grows so we will try to utilize this as much as possible by rushing down buildings and trying to push out as many builds as we can and that's where most of our money will go. So let's do these things in order. First thing first, let's take a look at the new character we got. So this is Dian Wei. We can notice the awesome art plus the unique armor. 15 points resolve, 6 points of instinct, base armor of 75, and 12% 12 uh, 12 speed boost. These are really good bonuses. Typically, if you want to know how good an armor is, find a character who has a very generic setting on the armor. And we do have one of those. I think Yue Jin is a good example of this. This is a generic legendary armor or unique armor for a legendary character. You don't have any unique bonuses. You have a flat 18 points of stat in your primary stat and you get the default armor of 55. It's a very boring stat line. And this is actually the developer's fault because for many of the new artwork characters or the minor artwork characters, they didn't develop the characters with more unique traits or bonuses on the armor, nor did they give them unique armor stats. Another example of this is Lady Bien. Take a look at Lady Bien. Somehow this robe ended up with 55 armor. That's the default armor. Robes should have very low armor, but it wasn't edited. So this was a very poor copy and paste job. And they did give Lady Ben some other bonuses to make up for the fact that uh, she has a unique armor, she has 15% range block chance, and 30% extra speed. Those are great bonuses. The speed in particular is actually quite amazing, which will make her quite a nice character to kite enemies around on the map. Uh, but aside from that, if we take a look at Guo Jia, who also has a robe. Notice how his robe only has 10 armor. So he's one of the first group of characters to receive an update to their character art. Therefore, his armor was patched up later on to reflect the fact this is just a robe. And you see that his armor also gives this army 10% character experience. So there's some uniqueness 
to this character. And we really didn't look at Guo Jia that much. We talked about his traits when we recruited him, but we didn't talk about his armor. We also didn't talk about his background. So astute advisor, 60 points of stats, very good. And what makes him stand out is he will give you minus 10% corruption faction wide if you make him a prime minister era faction leader. We'll reserve for that role for him once we become high enough rank to have a prime minister and he will fit in perfectly because at that time we'll have a pretty big kingdom or empire and we can utilize this minus 10% corruption to reduce corruption everywhere by 10%. Very, very powerful. So Guo Jia is pretty amazing as one of your civil officers. And then looking at the end weight, we already checked out the armor and we said this is better than the standard armor because it has 75 armor. So off the bat, it's already been uplifted from the 55 default. And instead of 18 points of primary stat, you have 15 points in his primary and six additional points in instinct. So that's plus three versus the 18 standard and then 12% speed. So those are all great bonuses. He also comes with a unique weapon here, the twin martial Z, which if you take a look, is not actually what typical champions use. Typical champion use these polearm weapons, but because Dan Wei historically used a pair of Zi, the game made an exception on his character to allow him to utilize this weapon. When in fact that he says he can equip all, but he really can't. You can't equip him with swords. It's just this item here kind of breaks the mold because it's kind of a historical item for him, even though it's not a unique item. It would have been better if they made a unique variant of the Marshall Z for him. That would be very cool, but that's probably not going to happen. And you can do many things with this weapon. You can give it to a administrator. Now, this isn't that much better in terms of saving. So Yue Jin's using the plus nine expertise, Jian, which is just a basic default common item. But what's better about Dian Wei's weapon is it has plus nine resolve on top of that, which boosts population growth. As a matter of fact, Dian Wei would actually be a great administrator too, just for the fact that he can boost such big amounts of population because of his high resolve. Now, we're probably not going to utilize him in that aspect because we're just going for cost savings, but those are all things you can make note of. His background gives 60 points of stats, distributed 30, 20, 10 between resolve, instinct, and authority, and all Armor for spear units will increase by 10% if we make him Prime Minister, Aero Faction Leader. That's not a particularly great bonus because spear is rather limited to other champion characters and you can get the same bonus on all of them with this. Of course, those two will stack. So if you happen to make him your Aero Faction Leader or Prime Minister and then you also have Trust, that will be 20% armor, which is quite strong, but not game breaking enough to go out of your way to do so as champions don't have other great skills to boost the entire faction. Now in terms of traits, intimidating, very awesome trait. Uh, it gives 12 points of instinct. We mentioned before how traits range from negative to plus 12, so 12 is maximum here. Also gives him immune to scaring, which will protect his morale. Beautiful gets eight points, but it's very good because it gives plus 10 satisfaction, which will help him keep him happy and counteracts pretty much the legendary difficulty modifier of the general discontent. Brave, another 12 point in his primary stat. So both of these are pretty amazing in terms of stat wise and then plus three morale. You see that he starts out level two for us and we also can pick his level two skill. That's not always the case. Sometimes the characters will come at higher level pre-build, but in this case we have a say. And we most interestingly for most unique characters is we want to find what their unique skill is. And he actually has a pretty interesting skill tree in that you can see his two active abilities here, Unyielding Earth and Stone Bark, are both Earth-related elements. So they're actually not wood-related, which is typically the element that's associated with champions. If we go onto a typical uh, Earth-related or Commander or Authority-related, you can call them many things, yellow, you can see the same skill, Stone Bark, uh, and then over here you have on yielding earth. These are the typical skills given to commanders. In this case, Dan Wei is very unique in that he gets them as champions. So he doesn't actually get any of the traditional champion skill, which is hamstring and binding fury. And then there's another skill here, usually for protection for your units in terms of charge resistance, which he doesn't have because he has a unique one here for vengeance. 
Dan Wei doesn't have any of the typical champion skills. Instead, he has a unique one called Cry of the Forest. And this activates when he has dropped below 20% health. It will cause terror and uh, multiply his damage by 6, which is actually insane. So Dan Wei becomes incredibly powerful if his health dropped below 20%. And that's a reflection on how he died historically. I'm not going to talk too much about history on this run, but Dan Wei basically served as Tao Tao's bodyguard. And as Tao Tao made an escape in a very sticky situation, Dan Wei held back at the gates protecting Tao Tao's escape and died there. So that's why he increases power once he dropped below 20% health. And that's why he has some commanding ability that gives him increased melee evasion, charge resistance, as well as range block chance and unbreakable, which allows him to stand there and guard, uh, which is a great reflection on how he was historically. He's also one of my favorite characters from Dynasty Warriors, which is a game that obviously is based on Three Kingdoms, but that's a story for another time. So what are we going to do with him in terms of this extra skill point? Well, one of the most important skills for any champion, vanguard, or strategist is actually the reach ability. Because this skill, like we mentioned on Xiao Dun, gives you 25% campaign movement range, which makes them excellent characters to utilize in armies as they allow you to move much farther. So we're going to try to go for this skill. And because we start out with trust available to us, that also can boost all spirit infantry's armor which would be the type of unit he would specialize in we're gonna go with trust first and then as you level up we'll go for reach and then flexibility for extra replenishment for the army as well now we are gonna stay away from this obviously if we go this route or else if we want to rush for this you want to take guile and into patience and pick up cry with forest that's the fastest way to it um, but we're not going to get this just yet. We're not intending to drop his health below 20% anytime soon. I'd rather get these utility bonuses for the whole army. So he's done. We familiarize ourselves with him. And the next step is to take care of all the buildings we have, which includes taking care of the assignment. We have two characters now available for assignment. Previously, we only had these two who are currently working. We have three assignments, two active. And then we assign two administrators, so they can't be assignment characters. And we have three in the army, which means Xia Yuan was the only one available, but he had a one-turn cooldown when we recalled him. So there was no one available last turn. Now we have two choices. So let's see what they can do. If we come in here, we see that Xia Yuan can do oversee mustering, which will reduce mustering turns by three. And I think this is a great time to actually dive really deep into mustering and talk about mustering uh, for the entire game and clarify everything for everyone. So when you recruit new units onto the battlefield, in the to game Total War Three Kingdom, they don't become ready at full health. They use something called a mustering and replenishment system to slowly grow those units to full health. But how many units do you get when you recruit them? You get 20% of the retinue when you recruit the units. And then there's 80% missing. Those 80% will slowly be given to you over 8 turns by something called a mustering rate. So mustering rate by default is 8 turns. And each turn represents a percentage heal to make, move you from the 20% initial recruitment to 100% maximum recruitment. So if we see bonuses like minus mustering turns, it's a minus to the 8 turn default option. So in this case, we will drop from 8 turns to 5 turns of becoming fully strength. So full strength will take 5 turns instead of 8 turns. So the missing 80% will be divided by 5 instead of 8. So at 8, it would be a 10% mustering rate or any newly recruited units in this commander. If it's 5, which is what this will do, the mustering rate will become 16%. So essentially, minus 3 mustering turn gives you a 6% boost in this situation. Now, why do I say in this situation? Because let's say if you already have bonuses that reduce your mustering term by four turns before you utilize this assignment. 
So instead of the default 8, you're already at 4. Then, when you're at 4, the mustering rate is 20%. But if you reduce it by 3 more, the mustering rate becomes 80% because it will be something that's called one turn mustering. And if you reduce it any more, it doesn't become instant recruitment. It defaults to 1, and that's pretty much instant recruitment because you'll be ready next turn to fight at full health, and that's pretty insane. But you also have to remember that's really unnecessary because you could have up to 50% replenishment at all time depending on your population in the commandery, depending on your military supply, depending on any other bonuses you have from the generals, from the reforms, or from any events that can help replenishment. And the replenishment will be added with the mustering turn. So if you have 50% on your uh, replenishment, you just need about 30% from mustering to boost to full to make up for the 80% missing. And that really will only take around, you know, three turn mustering. So minus five will pretty much max you out if you have good replenishment. So that's one thing you can consider. Or we can use military requisition and this will give us 15% recruitment cost discount in local commandery. This is actually pretty tempting. It will cost reserve, which means we'll burn through the reserve of the commandery. And if it drops to zero, bad things will happen. So we talked about how if you don't have reserves, you'll suffer through attrition, you'll get hit with a big public order penalty, and those are all things you might want to stay away from. Uh, so there is a cost to that. Now, of course, you could cancel it. You don't need to go the full five turns for this bonus because all you really need to do is recruit your unit and then just recall him right away just by pushing the little X and that will deactivate and you'll lose only one turn of six reserve, which is not a big trade-off if you're planning to recruit a huge army. But those are great options. Whereas the trade-off for mustering turn is 3k population growth. And I believe you can also cancel this because mustering is set when you recruit the units on the turn you recruit them. And once that's set, you can get rid of this and it'll still be the you know, bonus amount. The Anwei, on the other hand, has something called agriculture exploitation, and it gives you plus 50% food production in the commandery, as well as a plus four base food production. So it's a multiplier bonus, as well as a base amount. Now this is quite good, obviously, if you want to trade away food, but you become very dependent on this character remaining in this role, because if you over trade food and he times out after 15 turns, you're out of luck. You hit with negative food. Now the good news here is food trading last 10 turns, if you remember. All trade deals last 10 turns in terms of bartering amount. And that means if we utilize this and then trade those away, we are not going to be penalized when he expires because deals would have been expired long before his assignment expires. So both of these are possible options. And of the two, I prefer to actually take Xia Hou Yuan's for this case because we are planning to send our main army south and actually attack Huainan. So we're going to be recruiting. And because we're recruiting, I would like to reduce the cost. So let's assign Xia Hou Yuan here. The bonus is not active right away. There is one turn of preparing to go to the assignment. And then we have five turns of the active. So this turn, we are just going to move into place. Remember, you have to be inside Chen to take advantage of the bonus. So we're going to end up this turn somewhere inside Chen. We are going to move and get rid of the mustering bonus here. And that's going to be fine for us uh, because we're close to being maxed. And even without the mustering, we'll have 35% uh, replenishment, which might actually go higher because we have higher populations at Chen instead of Pengcheng. So we want to attack this. We're going to move our army to the edge of Chen. And that's as far as we can move anyways with our movement. You can see that the off to 35%. We lost 2% from not being inside a garrison, so the default amount drops to 4% from 6, but we make up for it for 2% from the population here. So not any change, and we're going to be expected to fully replenish after this turn. I'm going to wait till next turn to recruit uh, to make this army stronger. For this turn, we're just going to utilize our cash on boosting buildings because we do have this last turn of your economy grows. So over here, we said we want tax collection plus one utility building. 
and the one utility building is probably going to be Twin Tian, just because we can get stronger units, but we're also not recruiting here in the future, so this might be a bad idea. We might just go food production and synergize with two peasantry buildings, that way we can boost it if we have a new uh, character that's a commander class, we can send them in as tax collectors. I think we're going to utilize that, and because one building is free and one's not, you want to build the one that's not free. Because the 20% discount on a free building is rather pointless. And you can just check the rushing cost, um, it's quite high, I don't recommend rushing, there's really not too big of a benefit. You could upgrade this again, obviously, if you rush it and utilize the discount for that, but why would you do that when you have to pay 700 for it? because the amount you save is definitely not 700. You're only saving an additional 20% and it's not that much. Over here, however, we do have a different situation because there are a bunch of buildings I would like to build at super low cost. And that includes the government support, which is really, really inexpensive. And this building here, the livestock farm, I think we'll utilize this, check the speed up costs, 362 and then click this 650 so even though the building costs 192 the speed up is way too expensive uh, because of all the discount we're getting so instead what we're going to do is we're going to spend 362 to rush this to max this out and then just going to place the build in for this and let it finish and we'll maximize pretty much all the discounts we can get out of this your economy grows over here, we don't need to rush this because we can't build the level 4 upgrade without getting the necessary reforms. When it's red, it means we don't have it yet and there's nothing to upgrade to, so we're good. Uh, we are going to recruit armies next turn, so we're ready to go. The only thing that's left to do is whether we want to summon Dian Wei onto the field or not. Because right now he's not doing anything and we do want to defend here with the help of the administrator garrison but we can still put a unit on the field and i think it's actually wise to put units on the field because you prevent them from acquiring lack of purpose which we mentioned before so if i want a second army here all i would do is raise army and i would raise dian wait he has two d militias as part of his retinue we will disband those right away and the reason why we're going to disband those is they are not really going to contribute much to the defensive effort and we have to pay about 120 for each one, yeah 120 for each one, and we don't want to pay that. So they're gone and we're just going to stand here and help defend. Meanwhile we're going to set up to attack Sun Yu once again, try to capture him. Now Huainan is very very hard to take. Not only is it a walled city, a small city that's level 4, so it's walled. It has a military infrastructure building, which I know because i see it. And if you don't know, you can come here and take a look at it. It's the same look as this one. It gives you 4 extra units in the garrison. So if we take a look at the garrison size, you see the 4 additional units, which include some cavalry, which is rather annoying. And then the small city garrison, as well as the army on top. So quite a few foes and the fact that it's a garrison battle makes it a little bit more tricky. So we definitely want some tribuches here uh, in the next turn when we have it cheaper because of Xia Hou Yuan. And before we move on, there's actually a few more things. We have two new court positions available. Grant Commandant will reduce the cost of recruiting armies by 10%. It doesn't matter who's in this position, we talked about this before. This one provides 15% to peasantry, this one reduces army recruitment by 10%, and Grant Excellency will provide 15% to industry. We're still not going to utilize any of these because it's not worth it. The salary is 200 points, or 200 copper per turn. And if we take a look at our income, this is not a good way to estimate your income because you see 832 peasantry here. That's not the base peasantry. The base peasantry, if we take a look, is 315 here. There's a boost of 120%. There's additional 80 here. That brings us to 395, I believe. 
and in Pengcheng there is currently 25, so that brings us to 420. 420 is how much peasantry we have. We're getting a nice boost from the tax collection, of course, so that's why we have much higher amount listed in our treasury. But the 420 is what's going to get the 15%, and that's going to give us only 63 income per turn. For adding that position, that will cost us 200 per turn. So it's not good math, and we're going to not do it. There is, however, something we should do, and that is secure a new trade deal. Because like how we didn't put in assignment, we actually got an additional trade deal when we ranked up and we didn't utilize it last turn. We currently have a trade with Liu Chong. If we go to quick deal, we see that someone else around us could trade with us. In this case, one person is Kong Zhou, one person is Liu Dai. Now, both are viable targets. If you hover over them, you can see the actual trade value, resources being exchanged, and the diplomatic value they have on the deal. Both are viable trade partners in my opinion. Both hold land that we're not particularly interested in. Kong Zhou holds a piece of farmland. Liu Dai also holds a piece of farmland. Kong Zhou's farmland is part of Huainan. So in a sense, we could want to take, we like, we might want to take it just to complete the commandery, but like what we did with our very own farmland, this is part of Chen, we ignored it to limit our vision. And that's going to be the same thing here. So I might not want to take this and I could keep him around as a trade partner since he does uh, want to trade with us with a higher value here. But on the other hand, I need my northern borders to be as calm and peaceful as possible. So perhaps I want this deal. Both are fine. We can test out which one makes more monetary sense because they have different deal values. Liu Dai probably give us a better deal value because we had the marriage between us even though our father has died. So let's negotiate. And the daughter once again is available for remarriage. And we're not gonna try to grab her. Instead, we're gonna first check if he has items. He does, he has a spear. That's actually quite interesting. We don't need the spear, but it's nice to see that he has one. We are gonna ask for per turn payment and regular lump sum payment, just to see which one at 3.4 makes more sense. And I doubt he's going to be very rich with just a farmland, so I'm not going to grow. I want it. I'm missing a number there. Wanted to try 150. See, he's reacting very, very bad to that because he doesn't make much. You can see he only makes 209 per turn holding a farmland. Very, very sad. Uh, let's see, 80. No, not even close. Uh, 65. That's closer. 68, probably. Okay. And over here, all we have to do at this point is check this amount, because that's the equivalent amount. And you can see that's not a great deal. Um, his opinion of the idea is negative one. Economic power is the main issue here. So I'm not even going to offer him food because A, I know he has food. That's what he has. He has a farmland. He doesn't have money. And therefore, this will be the deal we can get. So 84 for 10 turns on top of a trade deal that's worth 347. That's one option. Option B is Kong Zhou, and this is worth 2.0, but the deal is worth 364, so about 18 more than the other deal, I believe. And we can also check his items, nothing here. We're going to ask him for both type of payment. He also doesn't make very much, but a little bit more than Liu Dai, mainly because he's not holding a gate pass. A gate pass costs more upkeep. And therefore he is suffering from that as well now maybe we can ask for about 80 oh actually no because he's at 2.0 we're not actually going to be able to ask for much maybe 51 or maybe yeah one more than what was available before and this one obviously doesn't work out so we could get 51 plus amount that has 18 more now obviously 18 more is lasting every turn so this is actually quite good we can also maybe ask for a bit more gold because his economic power and haven't spiked yet. So what we can do here is offer him a food even though we know he doesn't need it. 
it will still give us a pretty decent value. We want to basically use the opinion on the idea to cancel each other out so we can get more value out of it. And maybe we can get 75. Well, actually, we can get a lot more than that. That's actually very interesting. 86 is my guess. There we go. That's a good number here. And we're going to end up making more money by dealing with control and since we're not interested in fighting either one so either one would have worked and he will never stay a subordinate he doesn't like to be a vassal then that's fine we have no interest in vassalizing him either and we'll take this deal and we see that we can make coalitions now because we gotten the rank up now my opinions of coalitions are quite low I prefer not to be in coalitions because they will want to ask you to join wars that you don't want to be in. And I rather not offend my coalition members to vote against those wars every time they ask. Since I have no control over that, I prefer to just stay out of coalitions. And it's not like the AI coalitions are going to be very helpful in helping you fight your wars, as it's very hard to control AIs to help you in the way you want them to. So I tend to be the type to depend on myself in these matters. And we can, however, take a look at the other things. In here, we can get a non-aggression pack, which he's willing to pay for, which is something that's nice to see. And what we can do here is perhaps offer him one food, which will also give us 1.5, and try to get a little bit of money back for our efforts. Might be the minimum like 56-ish, 55 is the amount here, which is okay, um, which is perfectly fine in my book, and that allows us to complete this deal. And looking at our food situation, we have three left, we're trading again one more, we have two left. We're not upgrading any settlements anytime soon, so we're not really gonna spend any food, and we're also building more food producing buildings, so things should even out, and we can safely make this deal. <laughs> And the last thing you want to check is go back to negotiate and sort out by opinions and check all the deals you have, how many turns left, so you know when to refresh certain food deals. Because the last thing we want is for us to think we're safe because we are trading them food and then they timed out and we're getting slaughtered because they suddenly declare war on us because we're no longer giving them food. So just be mindful there. And we did our diplomacy check, we moved our armies, we got the extra trade deal, our income is way higher now because of those trade deals and diplomacy income, and we can safely end turn and prepare for the final assault here. Let's continue. All right, so during the end turn, sometimes the AI factions, as they take their turn, will offer you certain deals. In this case, Liu Chong is offering us a military access. Always pick Negotiate or Reject if you don't like it. And Negotiate will just show you the exact values. And here he's actually quite positive with us. And we can definitely accept this. Uh, but I tend to want to get every bit of bonus from these things. Therefore, I will actually either offer him a loan structure where we can get some money back. Uh, where we make a payment and he will make us per turn payment at a higher value but we can see here he's actually quite poor his economic power is really low but he has quite a bit of cash holding and also quite a bit of income which is actually quite interesting so in that case you can be flexible and try to get the deal from the other way even though wait even though we're not really getting the plus one in terms of opinions here. Right. So we're not going to be able to really make this deal until the food expires in six turns. And then maybe we can tack this on for extra value. Uh, but at this point, I don't think we're going to make a deal happen. And just going to reject him up here. He's not going to hate you for it. If he does, you will see it in terms of the consequences. If, let's say here we accept, he'll like us X amount more. And other factions who's at war with both of us will be hating us for this. In this case, we're just going to reject. It's not going to affect any relationships. All right, we are on the new turn. Notification once again. 
got a clay ox which gives authority and satisfaction so these type of items are perfect on your heir or prime minister because it will help you boost their authority which hopefully will increase satisfaction for the whole faction once they reach certain thresholds you see how it went from seven to eight because we hit 130 that's very helpful and also because the items themselves provide satisfaction she will also enjoy that benefit as well and you can also see it's part of a set. If we have the foreman item, this can help administrators save cost on certain type of building. So pretty great item overall. Let's just put this here. Then we also have more characters. And you see here, the art's gonna start repeating. For those of you who are not familiar with the game, you will see more typical generic commander, generic strategist. And we're gonna take a look at all of them. Now, even though he has a generic look, you can see from his background title, Voice of Reason, it sounds fancy. And we know it's fancy because if you look at the bonus, it's 35 points of extra stats. And we mentioned generic ones are always 15 points. If it's over 15, it's special. In this case, Voice of Reason is special because he is a historically important character and he will grant armies five points of melee evasion for his own army and also plus one wooden stake, which is a deployable pre-battle item. And we'll talk about those once we have them in our army. So far we haven't had them, so we couldn't use them. But he can give us one of them. And if we take a look at his skill tree, it's a pretty typical skill tree. Because he's a generic look, he's not going to have any special abilities. Now where he starts on the skill tree is not too bad. And his traits are actually quite decent as well. Uh, he can definitely be a great strategist. We talked about how we need a strategist for every army. So he is definitely a possible option, not too old either. And then if we take a look at the next commander, we mentioned how commanders, we might want one for another assignment for tax collection. So he could be an option there. He's an outsider, which is 15 points. So that's a generic one. And his traits are decent as well nothing too bad usually you don't want ones that has desire for higher office those characters are very hard to keep happy uh, in this case he has pretty decent and positive traits and he has reduced penalty from desire for higher office so that definitely helped that saves you about a level worth of satisfaction uh, six points and he has a pretty decent skill tree starting point as well and then we have Bang Ye, uh, who is an academic 15 points, so another generic one. He has some very interesting traits considering they're not his primary color, which is usually weird. He also is level three, so higher level, more skills. He actually has quite a good skill tree because resourcefulness is a very crucial skill for a lot of strategists because it unlocks flaming shot, which is a fire option for tribuchets. So that's a great skill to have. And aside from looking at them here, you always want to come to court and just hover over them real quick to see if they have any items. And in this case, they don't. Uh, so we're probably going to pass on all of them. Uh, even though he's a great strategist for us to add, we are not interested in adding a second army. Our first one's not even built yet. And speaking of building our first one, we're going to carry out some of the plans we put forth last turn. And we can also see it'll notify us which buildings we have finished. And that bonus is gone. We still have one turn of growing might left, so some extra replenishment this turn. Uh, credibility is still increasing, and we're almost over 75. So means next part of the tutor tutorial will be covering how to use credibility. And we also have another one turn increased recruitment. This is from Yue Jin's event, and satisfaction is high, which is the correct thing because we had that satisfaction low which I believe was a bug because none of our characters were in the red and if majority of our characters are in the green, which right now they are, we'll have this bonus of minus 10% corruption faction-wide and plus four military supplies faction-wide. Both very awesome bonuses. And in this case, let's build out our army. We have discounts this turn. So if we take a look, they're no longer a thousand plus. They're only 840 to recruit that 15% from Xia Yuan's kicking in. And that's awesome. And the big question here is how many tribuches to build? Because there are a couple school of thoughts. When the game first released, it was actually optimum to build six of these because they were so strong that 
You don't need anything else. 500 range flaming rocks hitting enemy troops will win you battles. Each of them will get you about 300-500 kills per battle. Very, very powerful. Then Tribuchets has gone through multiple nerfs to accuracy at lower levels from patch to patch until now we're on patch 1.6.1 beta right now as of recording. There might be more changes in the future when you are watching it. But just be mindful that now having six obviously it's overkill in terms of price and efficiency because they're actually quite bad at level one which is what we're recruiting them for so there is a different school of thought of using only one of them because we mentioned the reason why we want a siege weapon is to have that range advantage over enemy armies and thus force their army to march towards us that's really our goal is just to force the enemy march towards us. Therefore, having one versus two versus three are the same for us. We basically get what we want out of them by just using one. So that save us money, and that might be the way to go. And I am agreeing with this school of thought mostly. I tend to like to recruit two. Not because two trebuchets in the beginning is very strong, because accuracy has been nerfed and does hurt. So two is not that efficient, but I like to think about the late game and the end goal of the army. Guo Jia is a general that we're going to utilize throughout our campaign. He is amazing. So his units, his retinues, will stick with him and with us for the entirety of the campaign. So these tribuchets that we recruit now will not stay at level 1 forever. As they battle, they will gain experience, they will become stronger, they will eventually max out rank 10. And then they are quite powerful because the accuracy become very very high. And because we want to work towards that point, I typically recruit two of them. And it is quite pricey, as you can see it costs a lot of flat as well as per turn income. And I'm just going to swallow it, it's going to be the most expensive portion of our army. And we're going to recruit two. Now why do I recruit these instead of the other two siege weapons? They're all treated as siege weapons. But Juggernaut here, if you look at the range, is 65. They're a close range flamethrower, they don't give you the same benefit as a long range weapon. Multi-bolt crossbow does have high range, 400. It outranges all infantry units, which max out 250. So, in a sense, it can achieve what you can get out of trebuchets. But because it is a crossbow, the firing arc of this weapon is quite low. Therefore, it's bad against buildings, because it can't fire over walls that easily. It also can't damage walls. It can hit towers, but it'd be very small damage. But it can't destroy walls, whereas trebuchets can crush walls and can have very good firing ranges and angles because it's kind of flinging a rock over the machinery versus shooting out a crossbow. So in my opinion, anything that the crossbow can do, the trebuchet can do better. Therefore, at the same exact price for all siege weapons, trebuchet is just a clear winner. And there's really no debate. Uh, there's not a situ single situation where I think it's justifiable to go for the other two units if you don't have Tribuchets already. Now it doesn't mean these aren't useful or you can't recruit them ever. They can add flavor to your campaign. Flamethrowers are very fun if you don't mind getting up and close with the enemy and sacrificing some of your own troops because you need someone to help you lock them down before you blow fire on them and that sometimes causes casualties on your side as well. Uh, but they're very powerful. They do tons of damage per second based on their fire attack. Crossbows are okay if you have a nice flat terrain and a very narrow entryway perhaps at an encampment or at a small county where the enemy is going to file out of those small chokes and they'll be very crowded. Then the low angle impact of the crossbows can actually crush more men than the flaming rocks coming down at a steeper angle because they won't roll as much but these will kind of slam into a row of enemies and kill more so there are situations where they will outperform the trebuchet but the trebuchet is just a solid you know jack of all trade multi-purpose siege weapon that's the one you want 
and that's definitely the first ones you should get. You know, later on, if you want to have a fun army of lots of flamethrowers and have the money to throw around, then go for it in the beginning. For utility sake, get two trebuchets or get one at the minimum. It will change your life. And then we have two more slots. Six units is max. And I do intend to take full advantage of Xiaohu Yuan's uh, discount that he's giving us. And we're going to add two crossbowmen. Crossbowmen obviously have farther range, less ammo, and more armor piercing damage compared to archers, which has lower range, less armor piercing uh, damage on their range, but more ammo. We already have two archers for free. And another key difference is if Guo Jia can pick up the composure skill on his skill tree, archers can shoot fire arrows, whereas crossbows can't. So those are the counterbalance between the two type of units and we're going to go with two crossbowmen uh, because they have far greater range so they can outrange other range units and kill them for free so two of these we're going to keep two archers so that they can use their fire arrows to shoot down towers because sometimes archers are the best weapon against towers in the early game uh, where trebuchets are largely inaccurate so that army is set up. Guo Jia has a full retinue. He's done. Now we're considering should we recruit more units. We do have the money for it, both in terms of cash as well as per turn income. So what I'm going to do is increase a couple more spear guards for a sturdier front line. Two is slightly too few. So we're going to add two more. They are expensive both in terms of recruitment and upkeep costs so we don't want to go too crazy here and i think four is a good enough amount if you need a few more bodies i recommend getting about two more z militias they would serve you beautifully on the flank to protect you guys from uh, enemy cavalry the reason why i say they should go on the flank is because they have no shield so if you're facing front, the enemy range will come to you from the front and the shield will protect them from the range. But if you put the Z militias on the front, they will get shredded before they even enter melee. So they're best served on the flank. That's definitely one option. Um, I don't know if we need that option in a siege because there's not going to be cavalry running around trying to kill us. So we're going to bypass those and just get two more frontline units. There's Hulse Hall here. He is the cavalry portion of this army. If you remember correctly, we always want to balance army of range, infantry, cavalry. So Cao Cao has two choices, melee cavalry and vanguard cavalry. Now, we've been promoting the choice of sticking to color code uh, for certain reasons. Namely, Cao Cao's bonus could boost charge speed, could boost... Um, armor piercing damage on the weapon. There's also one boosting battle running speed. So those are type of the bonuses bring. And if we look at a Vanguard, Sao Yuan here, he also leveled up, so we have to do that. He offers some of the same ones, speed, charge speed. But there's a lot of crossover, charge bonus here, 25. And then this skill here in the middle is always the super unique one for your unit type. In this case, it's extra 25% melee damage for all shot cavalry. This is what Tsao doesn't have. And what Cao Cao has instead is one that increases melee cavalry's range block chance by 20. So the middle one's always a really special one for the unit type that you have. And in this case, because we have this, we're going to actually add on another melee cav as another tank for the army. Uh, we got to re-click the recruit. And there's two choices. The better one, the Jian Sword Guard, they're the slightly upgraded version uh, with more charge, uh, slightly more charge, and much more armor. But in our case, we're pretty happy with just the range block trends portion, and we're just going to get that. And feel free to recruit uh, Shot Cavalry on Tal's Halt because the unique bonus of the Vanguard, which is extra melee damage, is not a big deal for Shot Cavalry. Because shot cavalry damage, as we have seen, comes from the charge itself. Therefore, it doesn't matter if they have higher melee damage. They're never really going to use it. We just need some speed boost and charge speed, which Cao Cao can provide because they share the intensity skill. There is always every single yellow skill is going to be available for yellow characters. And then there's going to be an assortment, uh, six namely, in the second and fourth role. That's always a mixture of all the other uh, four classes in this case two red 
uh, one green, one blue, two purple. So it, it'll be different for every class. There's guides on characters and their skill trees on the channel if you want to learn about skill trees in more detail. But for our sake, we just know that Cao Cao can boost the cavalry equally as much as a Vanguard character. So that's nice. Another thing that Cao Cao is really good at is he's really high cunning. Cunning is why strategists are the range portion of your army. Because they give your army extra ammo. 60% extra ammo. And in our case, it's actually 75% on his retinue and plus 15% for everyone else. Cao Cao is quite a unique character in that his background gives him 40 cunning, which really shoots his cunning way up. And he has 47% boost to ammo, which makes him pretty much as good as any you know, strategist in terms of recruiting range units, so he has that specialty. So what we can do with him is maybe, since because he's a commander, he has a mix of all early tier units of other colors as well, spear guards available to him, and crossbows also available to him. So what we're going to do is tack on two more vanguard units and then two more uh, strategist units. So we have four cavalry, four crossbow, two archers, two siege weapons, and four spear guards. We're saving a little bit of money here by not flushing out the full army, but this is good enough. Our income is pretty much halved in terms of per turn income and our treasury is also dropped. And we're going to use the remaining money to upgrade some of our buildings. Um, over here we can get pretty cheap um, agricultural buildings because Yuan Huan's on the job and also because we are also on the last turn of our bonus for supervised construction. So what we're going to do is utilize that last turn by building this and immediately cancel him. This allows him to start recalling this turn which will actually make him available for us a little bit faster. Once you get the building order in, you can cancel the last turn, saves you a turn. And we also want to cancel the recruitment because we're done recruiting. We already save as much money as we can, so he's also done. Lady Bian can stay here and keep collecting taxes. And then we're also going to go to Xia Hou Yuan and give him a skill. Uh, we mentioned how good uh, the top row are battle skills and we're going to utilize him as a general so we're going to start on the top row. His unique skill is non-existent. The Blazing Saddle is his unique skill. We've already kind of seen this in combat. It makes him fatigued which is actually pretty bad and that's the only reason why this is not great. Uh, but we're going to just pick up mobility and start working our way on the top. Okay so we recruited a giant army. Do not move this army because you'll lose a ton of mustering. And you see here it's back to 10% because we're no longer in Pengcheng. The administrator there is giving us that extra one turn of mustering bonus. And what we're gonna do here is just sit here this turn, get 45%, and then move next turn as we move closer to the siege. And then we'll get to heal another 35%, or actually maybe a little less, 33% because we're in a lower population commandery. And that should put us close to being full. It might not be entirely full, I don't think it's going to go full, but it's going to be close and good enough for us as we can uh, just use whatever amount of men we have at that point to siege down Huainan. And that's all we can really do. We have all the Simon set up and uh, we have the army ready and all the buildings except for here. Right, we almost forgot one building. Always check notifications. We can put in the tax collection, which is free. Now it does take two turns, uh, takes a bit longer now because we lost one of the bonuses for turn reduction. And that's the same here. This is an upgrade from one to two, that was building one. This will take three turns. But notice now we're just building free buildings, right? We're gonna start increasing the free buildings upgrade. All of the cost buildings or buildings with cost, we already have them upgraded during the Your Economy Girls. So we saved the most money there. Now we just go back and build free buildings and we'll be fine. So now we're prepared to end turn. Let's do so. Um, one thing that came to mind before we do that is we actually had the option to increase taxes ever since we got our rank up to second marquees. It's this slider here on the bottom. There is five tiers of taxes. There is the increased one tier, which gives you 10% tax rate. So let's call this a 10% tax rate tier. It will drop every single commandery's public order by minus six. It will force your commanderies to increase food production from farming by 25%. You can boost tax rate to 
it hurts public order by 15 and then increase food production by 50. Or you can lower taxes by 10 and 20% and the bonuses are inverse of each other. And you can see the effects live by just tweaking it. You see you get about let's see, 109, 109 increase in income and then another, another 110 boost here. So about 219 if we boost it all the way up. There is an argument to be made. If you're playing the real min-max style, you could just do this. Because the penalty here, there's only one, you're losing public water. And as we lose public water, you see that there will be new debuffs happening to us once we break a certain threshold. Right now, it's negative nine. It's not that high. Currently, no effect from public order. So there's a neutral zone from like negative 25 to 25, I believe. And then as you slowly decrease your public order, you'll see some ill effect come on, mainly towards your population growth. And we'll talk about this. We'll actually take a look at this. So I'm going to leave the tax rate on the super high 20% one, not because I'm greedy. I mean, I am greedy. I usually don't change tax rate in my games. Uh, I can feel like it's a little silly, but um, it is helpful. You get more income, get more food, and um, we're gonna generate some rebellions for us to see, which is the reason why I'm gonna do it. And you gotta be mindful. Don't just look at your commanderies that have capitals. Even the ones that don't have capitals will get hit by this, and they will spawn rebels as well even if you don't own the whole piece so those are all things you should consider when doing this and rebels will only come at negative 100 uh, so we'll start seeing them soon over here as well all right that's enough let's uh continue till next turn all right living in harmony this is a simple relationship event in this case we get a deepening relationship between Cao Ren and Xia Hou Yuan uh, these are very random uh, mainly because they have similar traits or likings. In this case, they both favor duty. And this just means they became friends or are close to becoming friends. And that's a bonus we can have on the battlefield. And what's really great is Tao Tian's here. He has a full army here about to attack us in Pengcheng. And I'm quite excited because I'm going to show you guys how to defend this city or this large town from a large army like this with just one general and the garrison and our other army has been healing up pretty nicely and we lost a lot of our replenishment bonus because two of our 10 percent or 20 percent are based on events so they're gone we're gonna start moving them towards this location we can actually start the fight this turn it would be fine too so we'll have two big fights uh, next turn or uh, maybe one maybe only this one first because we have to wait till end turn for them to attack us we're not going to attack them here so those are all things we'll cover in our next part so i hope you guys enjoy this and see you guys next time bye